Hey everybody, I wanted to uh, return again um, a little bit today and talk some more about um, some of the developments that have been going on um, in deep learning and AI over the past week. Obviously you could make uh, at this point a video about um, the progression of uh, machine learning and AI uh, maybe every day, <laughs> the way at the pace things are moving. Uh, but I wanted to structure this a little bit as a not really a response to Wes, Roth, Wes Roth's video um, in any kind of critical way, but um, he had a wonderful update about um, the news this week that uh, came out about Google and OpenAI and sort of the, the conversation around moats or what they're calling moats. And if you guys aren't um, familiar with the, um, the leaked uh, document that came out of Google, it's basically um, some folks there or the product of some discussion there, um, talking about how they have some internal concerns that um, what they see is their, I think they call it their secret sauce, um, or you could think of as a moat, like a business moat, right? A business model, uh, a defensible business model that other people can't uh, easily replicate. Some of the, um, the panic there at Google really is, you know, how do we, um, not just how do we capitalize on large language models and deep learning, um, but you know, really, as I think, as the public has come to understand this discussion a little bit more, um, how do we, if we're Google, actually monetize um, this technology, right? And because it's not so much. I think initially there was some uh, thinking on Wall Street in particular that you know somehow because of. Microsoft's relationship to OpenAI or something, you know, just to, there's a lot of people firing from the hip on this stuff and saying like, well, you know, Google's behind OpenAI because OpenAI has, has uh, you know, GPT 3.5 and Google doesn't and they're, mo you know, so how are they going to integrate this stuff as well as Microsoft is, is going to be able to, that's not so much of a concern, I think. I think that's driven a lot by uh, people with, with two feet in the business world, right? If anybody, you know, familiar at all with the deep learning space knows that Google, Facebook, these, these organizations, um, perhaps you could break it out and say, yeah, OpenAI is two months ahead in this kind of particular application or something. But, you know, for the most part, Google has um, some, some really strong uh, capabilities in the NLP space and, and their ability to integrate that into um, into their product suite, I think is not that big of a concern, uh, at least comparatively to someone like Microsoft. The, the bigger concern really, and, and what we start to see in this, you know, do we have a moat or we don't have a moat kind of um, language and, and documentation is what is the way to make this, <laughs> what is the special sauce that, that creates a defensible um, you know, pillar for a business to operate, right? You need some kind of service that, that is distinct and that stands out. Um, you need to, you know, kind of through the effectiveness of that unique service, build a customer relationship that, um, that is durable and, and you can kind of build that, what Buffett would, Warren Buffett would call a durable brand advantage. You know, I think Google at this point would see themselves as having that, right? That if you want to query the internet and get reasonable information back, um, Google's the place that you would go to do that. And this is where, you know, competitors like Bing have, have struggled in the past, right? Is, um, you, you know, you have to beat the champ to be the champ. And, and there's not really a way to distinguish what you do uh, better, you know, to, uh, to, to create a delta beyond what Google can do to actually um, bring their customers over to, to you. And that's really what I think the moat that they're talking about from a Again, you know, my PhD is in, in international studies. I've worked as a machine learning engineer and data scientist for, you know, six years now uh, and worked as an NLP researcher for, for longer than that. I, I started doing that in my PhD program. So, you know, my, my business school experience is like, you know, three classes, right? So I, I would definitely say there are people who are better equipped to talk about that, that side of it than, than I am. Uh, but obviously you need some kind of product differentiation and you need some way of doing something that other people can't do. And when you talk about page rank and you talk about AdSense, you know, these are the things, these are the capabilities, the technical capabilities that allow Google to be Google, right? And to basically print, print money. Um, so, so I think that's where that concern is coming from. And, and in this document, you can start to see 
um, the concern here from from Google's standpoint, which is, um, you know, whether whether you consider us in front of OpenAI or in front of Facebook or Meta or behind them by six months or two months on this issue or that issue uh, is less important than <laughs> the reality that thanks to some, uh, you know, recent developments in the open source community, none of these corporations, uh, you know, increasingly none of them have a real advantage, a real moat over the open source uh, community. In particular, they talk a lot about um, uh, something called LoRa, which is a, a low-rank decomposition technique um, that that's come out of uh, that's really been open sourced at, at this point, and that allows you to essentially like freeze the uh, the matrices and some of the the layers of your uh, of your neural network, and um, sort of like how how a principal component um, analysis would work, it's it's sort of finding the sparse areas of that matrix, the, the parts of that matrix that aren't doing that much work and just dropping them, right? So you might end up with a matrix that's like 1% the size that you started with, but it still does pretty much exactly as well. Um, and what this stuff like LoRa allows you to do is you can kind of take the, the embeddings and take the, um, the pre-trained models, the transformer models that are coming out of places uh, like Meta, um, whether it's, you know, maybe it's Llama or something else was leaked, right? those things the real the real cost there is training them right this is where, where um, all the resources are spent um, on the compute to, to actually do that um, but with something like LoRa you can really um, go in and use those pre-trained models um, and not and not chuck all of those embeddings and not chuck all of that pre-training in the trash um, and, and you can reuse that and retrain it you know um, on on much more uh, modest uh, hardware, so it's again kind of flattening this uh, this training space and sort of I hate this term, but like democratizing, right? The the ability to train these models for bespoke tasks. Um, the other thing that they point out in the uh, in the Google document that I thought was really interesting was they also note like there's a lot of um, validity to that. Laura is a really cool uh, capability, a really amazing paper. I recommend everybody go read it. Um, but in the context of uh, of training a model, often, you know, a smaller amount of, of really high quality, well-labeled data um, will allow you to do more powerful things than just, hey, let's get a probability distribution of like the entire internet, right? Um, so, so there are ways, there are different ways to approach this problem, you know, more cutting edge um, ways and, and more sort of, um, you could think about them as like statistically robust, but sort of simplistic ways, right? Like like good data in, good model predictions out kind of stuff. But in either circumstance, that's that's open source available, right? You can do those um, at the at the individual level or at the at the you know a group of people can can achieve that kind of uh, retraining. And and so what they're describing I think is this concern that um, you know in a world where you can, you know, you can go in and, you know, sometimes with the help of a large language model, actually learn how to code up your own AI assistant, you know, without ads, um, you know, connect that to Siri in an evening, right? If you're a moderately technical person, um, why would you use a service that has ads and how much better would a service, an AI assistant need to be for you to tolerate ads, right? Because obviously, uh, with any kind of model built off of what Google has done up until now or Bing or whoever else, you know, the ads are, it's an ad company, right? You're, you're, um, you are relying on ad revenue to, to run the company. Um, so I think really what they're, what they're driving at, right, is um, an AdSense model uh, or a model that's built off of uh, how Google has done things before or how a lot of these internet um, you know, information companies have done things before isn't going to work here. There isn't a business case, at least not one that I can think of, um, where this product integration, whether it's Bing Chat or whoever else, right, um, there are open source versions of that that maybe they're a month behind, maybe they're two months behind, maybe they're better, right? Like there's there's some element of, yeah, the, the open source Llama models, right, at this exact day of the week, you know, don't have a reinforcement learning with human feedback mechanism, 
Um, but that's actually not the most difficult part of, of the modeling to even implement, right? Um, it's essentially, you know, a fancy annotation scheme, um, at least as I understand it. You guys can correct me in the wrong, if I'm wrong in the comments, but um, you know, that's something that can certainly be implemented, right, to improve conversationality, to improve relevance of answers, right? This is stuff you could work out in the open source as well. Um, so I think this is this is really interesting, right? Because if there's going to be a way to monetize this, um, it's not going to happen the way that, that AdSense works, um, because you're gonna have to have some other some other value add, whether that's through um, uh, some kind of information assurance in terms of the quality of the answers, um, whether it's through some other kind of uh, even like a <laughs> human expert kind of supervision of the answers that are being given. I'm not actually sure what it would look like, and I'm really curious in the comments if you guys have any thoughts about what a business model would look like to actually monetize um, these kinds of LLMs, because I, it sort of uh, strikes me as an extremely difficult problem to, to think through, given the availability and the quality, the increasingly you know, incredible quality of the open source uh, models that are, that are coming out of open source community. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's sort of one tier of, of the point I wanted to make off of this leaked document um, <clears throat> and and sort of in conversation with Wes Roth's video, which I thought was, again, excellent, um, was sort of, okay, they say they don't have a moat. Um, and in the, in the document, they sort of indicate, right, like we want to uh, integrate more and be more collaborative with the open source community, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which is all well and good. But Nothing in there really imparted to me any sense of um, having a business model. And I think that's interesting from the perspective of somebody who, like, I don't care, right? Like, I'd rather it not have a business model. So maybe I'm sort of seeing what I want to see, right? Um, but uh, where I wonder is, how does this ever uh, translate into a, um, into a revenue stream? And uh, I'm really curious if anybody has thoughts about how that would work. The second piece that I'd like to kind of think about is, um, a, a few weeks ago, I, I had made a video about the uh, Future of Life Institute um, document where they, you know, I think Elon Musk supported it and some other obviously heavy hitters, um, you know, actual heavy hitters um, from, the, um, from the deep learning community. Hinton may have been on that one. I can't remember now, uh, but a few big names for sure. Um, a few names that are much more relevant than Elon Musk, right? Um, but he, he gets the headlines for, for obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> the but the more important point there is in that um, in that Future of Life Institute petition where they're calling for a pause in training uh, and in developing these things until we can get a better handle on it. One of the other ways that they described controlling uh, you know large language models and deep learning to, to sort of al wait for alignment to happen or wait for alignment work to to kind of take off and uh, make these models more more in alignment with, with human existence. Um, they didn't specifically refer to it this way, but as a scholar originally of international studies, I couldn't help but see it as uh, essentially a, um, a call for arms control, right? They wanted to track um, the, the uh, development cycles of these models through um, looking at you know where the compute resources uh, do exist, where you see the energy spikes, presumably that, that correspond to the training of these models, that kind of thing. Um, and at the time, obviously, I was fairly skeptical of that idea for reasons that you can go find in that video, which I'll link above. Um, but, the, you know, the nature of the, the extremely rapid pace of this development, you know, within corporations, but in, increasingly within the open source community uh, and things like Laura, right, where you're really, again, you know, throwing up in my mouth a little bit, but democratizing the ability to train these things. Uh, or flattening, you know, and, and opening up access to be able to do that. Um, I, it's just another point of, uh, the, of increasing skepticism, right, of that idea that you're going to be able to sort of like isolate the compute resources that are required to do this because there's a whole, you know, the ma vast majority of the community of people who are interested in these uh, models, in these, in these deep models, in these, in these large language models, are people who do not have, you know, a silo of supercomputers. They don't have an AWS uh, cluster. They don't have an on-prem cluster. They don't have anything like that. They're people like you and me who have a computer and they have a graphics card and they want to be able to uh, make a personal assistant or they want to be able to do whatever they want to do, right? And 
So there's this huge, huge pressure and incentive in that community to do things like what Laura is doing. And that's only going to get better, right? To be able to, okay, we'll freeze the weights from the whole internet and we can add uh, through this kind of low ranked uh, decomposition. We can sort of, uh, f you know, fiddle with a much smaller subset of the weights and then we'll compare and contrast to see how much um, accuracy, what, how our metrics are faring given that modulation. And that's going to continue to be a huge driver in the community for the development of, um, of methods by which retraining um, and, and architectural development will be um, accessible, right, to, to average people. So just one more reason to really be um, as much as we're obviously concerned, we're reading people like, you know, Hinton saying this is going to kill us all, right? This technology is incredibly scary. And in some ways it, it really is, especially for the labor market, as I've talked about before. Um, again, these kinds of open source developments, it, you, it makes you really skeptical that any kind of arms control, I'll use my term again, arms control approach to controlling uh, the, the training of these models makes you really skeptical that that's um, going to be feasible or going to work long term. Um, so I, again, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments uh, below about that idea. You know, do you think uh, with the progress in open source that an arms control kind of approach works here? Or are you skeptical as I am? Maybe you think of, you can think of a reason there that I'm wrong. Uh, and then and then also this this other point that, you know, um, <laughs> right. How do you build a business off of a technology um, that that is fundamentally you know incredibly available um, in the open source and, and um, in which you know the open source community is constantly working to um, eradicate your moat right um, but yeah looking forward to your thoughts on it and as always thanks for watching.